stand together as we sing Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Definitely can't be sitting down when we sing this song. So we'll be singing it on the first, the second, and the fourth. Let's sing on the first. Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Victory in Jesus. We'll sing all three verses together. I heard an old, old story.
plus concerned, you know. That's down there on the bottom of things. But I tell you what, that's what we've got to be anymore is flexible in all things. But we are glad to see you here this morning. We had great services this morning with our seniors. And had by, we've got started our Sunday school classes. And so if you weren't aware of that, uh, each what we're doing is each service we're having one Sunday school class for. And so we're still trying to keep every service segregated for the time being. Uh, and probably we'll do that through about mid-July. And we'll see where the numbers are in the state and in the country. And, and then we'll... Uh, that maybe make some decisions accordingly uh, when we get to that point. And so if you want to come to Sunday school uh, for your class, it will be at 930. And so it's already over. You missed it today. I heard it was fantastic. I heard they were giving away free steak and shit. No. <laughs> But it, I, it's across the way over there in B8, and so that's for any of you that's in this particular uh, worship service. So if you want to make Sunday school next week, that's when it is. Uh, we do have children's uh, Sunday school as well. We're splitting them up into two groups right now and keeping them there uh, for a little while, and we'll see how that continues to move forward in the near future. We would also have teens separated across the way for Sunday school. And so we're going to be offering the teens a Sunday school class at 930 and then one also at 5 because our teens are kind of coming in those two services there. So we're trying to make uh, accommodations for everybody, and like I said, we'll keep it this way for at least the next probably five or six weeks, and then uh, we'll make a decision whether we need to make another change and go move forward. But I'm glad to see you here this morning. I tell you what, let me just thank everybody who had a part in the uh, offering for the Navajos. Uh, what a tremendous offering. I was just ecstatic over that. We didn't give you much time, so I didn't know what to expect. You know, we gave it, we told you one week that next week we're going to take up the offering. We gave over $5,100 uh, to the uh, our offering. I would dare say at least probably 90% of our people uh, had a part in that. And uh, because of uh, your graciousness along that regard, we uh, rented a 20-foot U-Haul truck. We packed that thing about three quarters of the way up, all the way from the front end of that thing, all the way to the back. Had over a hundred cases of water. Had tons of toiletries. Uh, you know, toothpaste, toothpaste, toothbrushes, everything you could imagine to try to get, help them with uh, hygiene and trying to keep this uh, uh, COVID away from them. And so, uh, put it on board, and they shipped that out there. Uh, Jason and and uh, and Noah and Anthony took it up yesterday morning early. Uh, delivered all that to the Nezes and then came back. We had so much come in that we couldn't even use it all for the Nezes. And so why we called our other missionary on the Navajo reservation, uh, Aaron Nelson, who's uh, in a totally separate area a little farther away. And I said, look, I said, uh, I, I, how are you doing? And he said, well, we're trying to, and they were trying to do the same thing as the Nezes, trying to provide the, he said, so I'm running into Albuquerque every once in a while to purchase some supplies. And I said, well, I tell you what, we're going to help you out. So we sent $500 to him. And so he was going to run into Albuquerque, buy a bunch more water, a bunch more toiletries and things like that and take it to his people as well. So thank you so much for having a part in that. You know, because we're split up, obviously it's impossible for everybody to get to see what's going on in Nor at North Valley Baptist Church. So from time to time, we thought we, what we would do during this time is just show a little video and just to kind of keep us all up to date about what's taking place. Now, for whatever reason, the wording is lagging behind the video type of deal. So it looks like one of those old, uh, you know, uh, kung fu movies, you know, and so... <laughs> <laughs> and so just bear with us on that, but you'll get the gist of it. Well, at least you'll kind of have an idea of what's going on at North Valley because there's some, there's some exciting things, even though we've been up and running only for just a few weeks. So at this time, we're going to show that video. As a storm raged about them, the disciples were afraid. For the waves were high and the ship was tossed, they could not find their way. Then they awoke the Master, saying, Lord, please save us now. He rebuked the wind and the sea. Hey, church family, I just want to introduce you to our newest members. This is Ed and Casey Orns and their son, Camden. We just want to say we're really happy to be here and become members of the church. We've been on here for about a year, um, thanks through to an invitation from Austin Pace to our son, Camden. And um, we just are really happy to be members of the church and to um, see what our gifts and talents can be to serve you and others in the church. Amen. Ed and Casey joined by way of testimony, and Camden got baptized tonight. So, so thankful for them, and God bless you. Camden, 
based upon your profession of faith before God in this church, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son, bearing in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. This is James Thompson. And James knows, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes, I do. And James, upon your obedience to the Lord's command, upon your public profession of faith in Him, I baptize thee, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Ready in the likeness of His death, raised in the likeness of His resurrection to walk in newness of life. All right. This is his wife, Becca. And it's been a pleasure to get to know them. I tell you what, I love what the Lord's doing in our young married uh, uh, classroom. Becca, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. And Becca, upon your obedience to the Lord's command, upon your public profession of faith in Him, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, raised in the likeness of His death, raised in the likeness of His resurrection, to walk in the newness of life. to have Linda Burnham here with us today, and Linda decided to join this morning, and so that's always a blessing, and so uh, Linda, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I, I was saved in, uh, in Bethel Mission Baptist Church in Lenore, Kansas when I was 14. Um, I married a military man, wound up in, in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, I've been, the Lord just kind of brought me down here. I was planning on going to West Virginia with my youngest son. I came here to celebrate my Aunt Violet's birthday, and the Lord hasn't let me go yet. <laughs> so, so that's awesome. And so, you know, instead of just, uh, you know, being here, she decided, you know what, I need to be a part of the church. And so we're glad that God has led her here. And so if you get an opportunity to see her, make certain you get by and tell her how glad you are for her. And certainly be using your gifts and abilities to edify her. And I know she's already talked about how that she wants to use her gifts and abilities to edify the rest of the body. So we're, we're glad to have her with us now and be a part of North Valley Baptist Church. in our lives, even though, you know, things aren't exactly back to normal. God still works in our lives. Let's stand together as we sing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Let's sing it on the first. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to Say the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to. sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that He is with me, will be with me too. 
Great job saying trust and obey. Let's say on our last song this morning, trust and obey. Let's think about the words as we're singing this morning. Trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the line of Pastor Jason will sing a special for us. You never asked me to stretch out my arms. No one put nails in my hands I'll never feel the weight of the world Or carry that cross on my back Nothing I do could ever repay All that you did on that day up there on that tree you paid the price so that I could be free you died for me now I'm living for you Lord that's the least I can do you never send me out on my own you're always leading the way all that I ask for is a home in my heart 
and only a small seed of faith. I know you gave me all that I have, so why wouldn't I give it back? You took my place up there on that tree. You paid the price so that I could be free. You died for me, now I'm living for you. Lord, that's the least I can do. You didn't have to walk down that road. You didn't have to rescue my soul. Lay down your life just for me. I should have been taking those steps. It should have been my last breath. But you just want me to believe. You took my place up there on that tree. You paid the price so that I could be free. You died for me, now I'm living for you. Lord, that's the least I can do. Lord, that's the least I can do. If you've got your Bibles, join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Continue on through our study of the book of Corinthians here. And uh, our theme this year, obviously, is the power of God. Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth, and he's a little frustrated with them. And for good reason. You know, they certainly were not living like they ought to. And uh, they were not living like saved individuals, like the power of God was upon their life. And so he reminds them at the start. And since that point, he's been addressing some different issues that they had in the church. And we're going to be looking at one of those uh, this morning. Just trying to get them to understand that you should not be living this way because the power of God is now upon your life as a believer. You should be living something uh, much greater that would give God the glory. So let's, uh, if you've got your Bibles there, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's stay in honor of reading God's Word. We're going to pick it up right where we left off last week. And so we're going to start in verse 12 and read down through verse 20. Paul here writes, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we're grateful for your word, and Lord, we would ask that you would speak to us through it this morning, that Lord, we would hear your voice and not my own. And Lord, we would just ask that you would not only help us to see the truths that you have preserved for us here in this section of scripture, but more importantly, that you would give us the grace to be obedient to them so that we might live our life in a manner that is pleasing to you. We thank you, Lord, for this time. Help it to be profitable for all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for standing. You know, in his younger years, Paul was trained as what we would call a Pharisee. And so he was taught that in order to be accepted by God, one had to live a life based upon the Old Testament laws and the traditions of men that were passed down through the generations. Now, this meant that he had to live a life that was incredibly restrictive. 
For instance, the Old Testament law says that no Jew is to work on the Sabbath. Now, religious leaders, feeling this law was too vague, decided that they needed to interpret what the word work entailed. And so in their interpretation of the law, they decided carrying a burden was an aspect of work. And we can understand why they would say that. I mean, obviously, you know, I've, if I've got a, a big old rick of wood over here and I'm going to move the rick of wood from there over there and I'm having to load up and move from one, I'm calling that work too. You know, I know when I'm done doing something like that, that's work, you know. I, I understand that, you know, in our, in our community, some of us uh, put new rock down on our, our, our yards, you know, and, and we have to... Uh, take shovels and throw it in a wheelbarrow and move it over from one place to another, and that's a burden, and that's work, that's labor. So we understand why they cause that, but that wasn't enough for them. So it wasn't enough just to say, okay, if you're carrying a burden, that's work. Then they decided, well, we got to figure out what, does, what, is it, what makes up a burden. And so they had to define it even further. And so they felt compelled to explain what constituted a burden. And they decided that a burden is, and I quote from their own writings, Food equal in weight to a dried fig, enough wine for mixing in a goblet, milk enough for one swallow, honey enough to put upon a wound, oil enough to anoint a small member, water enough to moisten an eye salve, paper enough to write a customs house notice upon, ink enough to write two letters of the alphabet, if you only could have had, was carrying around enough ink for one letter, I guess you were okay, read enough to make a pen, and on and on and on it went. Now, therefore, those like Paul spent their time worrying whether a person could move a lamp from one place to another or whether a tailor was committing a sin if he was walking around with, you know, a, a thimble or some, a, a, a needle and some thread in his pocket or, or if parents could even lift their children on the Sabbath day. Was that really okay? And if you think I'm exaggerating, remember that these people tried to condemn the man who was carrying his bedroll after Christ had healed him. He had been lame. Christ allowed him to walk again, made him where he could walk. And as he's carrying his bedroll off, the Pharisees stopped and said, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you think you're doing? And they allowed him to go past, but they still didn't like the situation. They, they were annoyed that Christ would heal on the Sabbath because they thought that was work as well. And so all of this, now think about this, all that we're talking about deals with just one aspect, this whole idea of burden, you know, this caring bit about work, only one aspect of one of the laws of the Old Testament. You can just imagine the weight that these individuals must have felt upon themselves when considering all aspects of all the commands that are in the scriptures. And so yet this was the very essence of their faith, that their religion was based on legalism where they had to adhere to all kinds of rules and regulations if they were to be accepted by God. But when Paul met the resurrected Christ on the Damascus road, such thinking for him was obliterated. He recognized that he was no longer compelled to try and keep every jot and tittle of the law because Jesus had already done that for him. Paul recognized that the hope for acceptance with God that he could not obtain through his own works was found in the finished work of Christ on Calvary. And so therefore, Paul stopped trying to save himself and instead put his faith in Christ as his Savior. And from that point forward, Paul felt this great release upon himself. That burden was lifted off of his shoulders. He no longer had to think about everything, whether he could or whether he couldn't. He recognized that in Christ, he had great liberties and he had great freedom. And because of that, it was one of the mainstay talking points or preaching points or teaching points that he had from that time forward. You know, the Galatian church, he told them, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, talking about the law. To the Romans, he wrote, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. 
To them, to the same group of believers, he said, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He says, we don't have to worry about sitting there going, making certain we have this check off list. He says, we can just serve in a newness of spirit, having this spirit of thankfulness and of love for our Savior. And so though Paul loved to teach on the liberty that believers had in Christ, if you notice He almost always taught it in the context that we have been freed from trying to gain salvation by our own righteousness. And his instruction was that we no longer have to try and earn our way into heaven, which we could never do anyway. Why? Because we're all sinners and come short of the glory of God. And so Paul further argued that since believers had been saved by grace... There is absolutely no sin that can cause us to lose our salvation. When we got saved, Jesus Christ made a promise. He says, whosoever believeth on me shall have everlasting life. Well, that life starts the day you believe on Jesus Christ. That's why when he writes to the church in uh, in Ephesus, he says, for you who were once dead in your trespasses and sins have now been quickened or made alive unto Jesus Christ. So that's when we were born again, as Jesus said. We were born again. We became his children at that point. And Jesus promised that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. That means it will never, ever, 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 ever end. We will always have a relationship to him. Why? Not because of anything we have done, but because what Jesus Christ did for us, and therefore we have this great assurance of our salvation that no matter what we do in this life, no matter what sin we commit, we are no longer under the condemnation of Almighty God because we have been born again in Jesus Christ. And so he tells us this. He says that God is the one that presides over the highest court, and he has declared every believer to be righteous in Christ. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 states, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And so the Corinthians, though, so this was Paul's background. Coming out of this legalism, coming out of these restrictions, and now having this freedom to move in Christ. But the Corinthians, on the other hand, were coming from a completely different background. They were not coming from a background of legalism. They were coming from a background of licentiousness. They had been saved out of idolatry. And not just any idolatry, but most of them had worshipped at the feet of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of sexual love. Within her temple, there was, there was a major temple in Corinth to Aphrodite, and then there was two smaller ones. And within that major one, there was said to be a thousand priestesses. We would look at them as just prostitutes today. And when one had sexual relations with them, it was viewed as a mode of worship. So instead of living restricted lives, these individuals had lived these lives that were more just catered to the flesh, that they just kind of did what they wanted to do. And sadly, for many of them, this did not change immediately after their conversion to Jesus Christ. Though they were believers in Christ, many of them were still having sex with the temple prostitutes, no longer as a means of worship, but just as a means to gratify their flesh. And this was the problem that Paul was addressing here. So freedoms, we can look at, are wonderful things. I mean, we're Americans. We love our freedoms, don't we? We shout them to the high top. We have a whole day separated to celebrate them. And they are wonderful things. But every freedom needs to be tempered with responsibility. You know, because if we don't, they tend to promote excess and the feeding of the flesh. You know, I have the freedom to preach to you this morning. You know, I'm glad for that. I can stand here in the pulpit and freely preach. But if I do not temper that freedom with some responsibility, I could preach things that might potentially incite riots or promote hatred towards other groups. You know, most of us as adults here today have the freedom to drive on our city streets. But if we do not temper that freedom with some responsibility, we can cause accidents that can leave others injured or dead. So the more freedoms that we have, the greater this responsibility that we need to bear. Now the Corinthians, they were a prime example of people who wanted to enjoy their freedoms, 
but did not want to take on any of the responsibilities. You know, they had bought into the motto of their, air, uh, uh, of their city, which was just kind of an unrestrained attitude. Matter of fact, they had a motto there in the city that said, all things are lawful unto me. And, and so the believers here at Corinth were thinking, man, okay, we put our trust in Christ. We now recognize that we're born again. We're a child of God. We cannot be unborn. We now have all this freedom about us. We can go do anything we want to go do, and we don't have to worry about the condemnation of God upon us. We are going to be in heaven with him. We're going to always have eternal life. And so they were looking at this. Hey, we can go do whatever we want to. All things are lawful unto us. But Paul comes along and he says, just because we have great freedom in Christ does not mean that we should always exercise it. To the saying of the Corinthians, all things are lawful unto me, Paul included, but all things are not expedient. The word expedient means to be helpful or to be profitable. You know, some things that we can do lawfully are not necessarily profitable concerning our Christian walk. In fact, some things can be very detrimental. You know, for instance, any type of sin is not profitable. It's always going to bring loss. You know, James said, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Talking about destruction or separation. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. That's just the nature of sin. If you're going to dabble in sin, you're going to have to pay the cost that comes with it. Why? Because that's the way sin works. It's just the natural progression of sin. But it isn't just sinful things. You know, other things can be detrimental as well. You know, for instance, you know, we certainly have the ability and the freedom to spend all kinds of time on the internet. You know, we could spend hours upon hours surfing the internet and just seeing what's on the internet and just going to town. That way you not be sinful, but it's not profitable either. It's not going to help our relationship with our Lord. It's not going to glorify his name in any way. It's not going to help others come to him. It'd just be a waste of many precious hours that we could have used for more beneficial things. And so therefore, we should not make decisions based upon whether we can or whether we can't. Rather, we should be making our decisions as Christians based upon whether we should or whether we shouldn't. You know, if we exercise the freedoms we have, will it help us to become more like Christ and will it glorify his name? So Paul gives this overlying principle. Yes, all things are lawful to you. You're not going to be under the condemnation from God. He goes, but all things aren't expedient. So he gives this overlying principle. Then he comes on and he addresses the problem here at hand, the idea of fornication. And he tells them, he says, God's design designed our bodies in a way where food and our stomachs were made for one another. Now, we as Baptists ought to all say a good hearty amen to this. Because we, we get this relationship between the, the, the belly and meats, as Paul says it here. Man, we recognize meats are for the belly and the belly is for meats. Man, this belly here of mine is perfectly suited to put some meat in it. And I love that fact of it. And uh, so after I say the last amen here, I'll be skirting back to the house. And as our tradition is at the home, since Zach works at a pizza place, you know, we'll, ho hopefully if, if my wife is watching, she'll have it on the plate before as I get there. And we'll pull up there and there'll be some pepperoni and sausage and all these things. And we'll go to town and the meat will be for the belly and my belly it will be for the meat and we get that and, and we recognize that but that's not the way it's always going to be Paul states here that there's going to come a day when this process this th this relationship between the meat and the belly is going to end it's going to be destroyed that that biological uh, state that biological process I should say will have no place in the eternal state we will eat different foods in our glorified bodies and we will be they will be processed differently. How? I have no idea, but it, that's what Paul's stating here, that that process is going to end. Now, this is not true, though, when we consider the relationship of the Lord to our body, as he says there in verse 13. Our bodies are designed not only to serve the Lord in this life, but also in the next. Now, again, the Bible teaches that our bodies will be resurrected after death. And they will be changed, but the purpose for which they were created will not. They have been given to us to glorify the Lord and to build a relationship with him, and they will be used for that purpose for all eternity. 
Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 and 21 teaches us this. It says, for our conversation, and that Greek word there is citizenship. So he says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned and like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So he says, okay, you will still need a body, I will still need a body in heaven when we're there with him, when we have the eternal state here upon the earth. He says, you're going to need this body, and he goes, this body will Will still be used for the same purpose it was created for now and that is so that you might have a relationship with me and that you might glorify me through that body and what Paul states here is he says fornication perverts this design as believers our bodies are not only for the Lord but as he says here but they are of the Lord they are members of the body of Christ now, the body of Christ, we recognize, is the church. It's his body. He's the head. And so what he's saying here is, you know, when, when he goes in, and we'll get there, uh, when we get around 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he begins to talk about the body and how that we're all individual members. Just as my body has all kinds of different parts. I got 10 fingers, I got 10 toes, I got two knees, I got two uh, shoulders, you know, I got one nose, I got two ears, all these different members, but they make up the one body. And what he states here is, is he's saying that when you recognize this, each one of us as a believer is a member, one member of the entire body of who? Jesus Christ. And he says, so therefore, he says, not only are you made for the Lord, but your body is part of the Lord. Therefore, for Christians to commit sexual immorality is to take members of Christ and then make them members of harlots, or if the sin is committed by a woman, to whoremongers. So this is because fornication involves a union. The man and the woman become one flesh. And therefore, when a believer commits sexual sin, he or she involves Christ in the process. Now, this is not to imply that Jesus is somehow personally tainted by the sin. He is not lowered or defamed that way. But his name and his reputation is sullied because of the association. You know, even the lost world understands that Christ and sexual immorality do not go hand in hand. You know, this is why they mock Christians who get caught committing such acts. They know that they have done something that is completely contradictory to the Lord that they profess. What then should a Christian do when faced with sexual temptations? Well, Paul tells us here in verse 18, flee fornication. He says, don't mess with it, flee it, get out of there. You know, we are to immediately extricate ourselves from the situation. We are not to see the flirtations of the opposite sex as a spiritual challenge to be met, but a spiritual death trap to be escaped. You know, we should follow the example of Joseph. You remember Joseph there in the Old Testament? He was bought by Potiphar, and he was doing such a good job as a servant that Potiphar put him over all his household. I mean, everything. The only thing you know, he knew that he was not to have any part of was Potiphar's wife. But Potiphar's wife started making eyes toward Joseph and, and began to try to seduce him. And at one time, she came upon him, and he ran. I mean, he just bolted. Now, I'm telling you right now, many in our day and age would say, what a pansy, you know? Goodness gracious, man, Joseph, man up, boy. You know, you can't sit there and just sit there and take it, you know, and, and just kind of flirt along with her a little bit and then walk away. You know what? We may call him that, but God certainly never did. He commended him for it. What did Joseph do? He fled fornication. He says, I'm out of here. Why? Because he recognized, I'm just a man. I, I can fall into this trap just like anybody else can. I remember when I was a younger, pious Christian, I used to look at people who had fallen down, and I'd think, boy, man, what are they doing? As I've gotten older, though, I realized how easy it is. Never done, praise the Lord, I've never, you know, cheated my wife. And I'm telling you what, I get it. You sit there and watch it over and over again, you recognize we're all made of the same flesh. We all have the same weaknesses. And we shouldn't be dabbling around with that type of stuff. You know, in writing to his son, Solomon warned him to reject the advances of immoral women. He said in Proverbs chapter 5, For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood. And what does he tell him to do? Remove thy way far from 
her. He doesn't say to stay within her vicinity. He says you get all the way out of this vicinity. He goes, you get remove yourself as far as you possibly can and come not the nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Fornication is not only a heinous sin, but as Paul writes here, it's a unique one. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, unlike other sins, it damages one's own body like no other. Now look, drugs, <clears throat> alcohol, and gluttony, they certainly damage the body, but not in the same way as sexual immorality. You know, this has to do with God's reason for the creation of sex. According to him, sex is to be experienced within the confines of marriage. And it is a gift that he gave so the relationship between a husband and a wife could be deepened. This is really well is illustrated by the Old Testament word used for it. The, the Hebrew term is yada, which is interpreted to know. And it's used over and over again in the Old Testament. And it just means that that sexual intimacy allows a, a, a married couple to know one another in a deeper state so that their marriage can become more intimate and more close. Now, why? Because God always uses the marriage of his people to, to be a symbol or to be a type of the marriage he has with his bride, the church. The goal of both is the same, that we might become one. What do you mean by that? A married couple, God's desire for them is that you think alike. You, you ever been around a couple and as they age, they almost start looking the same? <laughs> it's sometimes a scary thing, you know? But they just, they, they, they begin to think. You, you ever been around people who have been married very long, if they have a good relationship, and they can almost finish each other's words for them? You know, that sentences for them, they can just go right along. They just know what the other's thinking. Sometimes you don't even have to say it. You ought to still say it, by the way. <laughs> But, you know, they just know why. Because they've been around so long and they got this intimacy together. They've been so close in their relationship, not just through the sexual aspect of it, but that's part of it. And they have just grown so close together that they're just one. And that's God's desire for his church, his people, to be with him. He says, I want you to, what, understand my word so well and be so consumed with it and have a relationship with me that we just grow as one. That's why the scriptures say that Christ is in us and we are in him. In other words, we become one and the same. You can't hardly differentiate one from the other. That's the design that God made when he made sex. It's a tool, it's a mode where two people can become one. Well, the problem with sex outside of marriage is that it divorces the means from the desired end. It, it devalues our bodies where they become vessels for personal gratification instead of vessels whereby a, wonder, whereby a wonderful God-honoring relationship can be built. Now this separation of the means from the end can really be likened almost like bulimia. We, we all know about bulimia, you know, a bulimic separates the consumption of food from its desired end, which is what? The nourishment of the body. So a bulimic satisfies the desire for the food, but in doing so in this way, it actually destroys their body. Now, isn't that crazy? So in other words, they're taking a real desire that should be in every one of us. They are consuming the food, but in the manner in which they are doing it, it causes their body to be destroyed. So now then they get the means, but it does not, it destroys the desired end. The same thing can be said for fornication. Fornication satisfies the desire for sex, but in doing so will destroy the marital relationship it was created for, and it will also destroy the relationship one has with Jesus Christ. And so it takes that which it was created for, so you get the satisfaction and the desire there, but then it destroys the means or the end that God created it for. And so that's why he says here that it's a very unique type of sin. Well, through all of this, then he concludes this section of Scripture, and he says, there's a reason why you want to live pure life, lead and live pure lives. Every believer has been indwelt 
by the Holy Spirit of God. And so that means that the Holy Spirit is a seal that we now belong to him. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, Ephesians chapter 1, 13, 14 gives us this type of doctrine as well as other places in the scriptures, but it just reads, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And so when it talks about this sealing effect that the Spirit has on us, in in biblical times, kings, when they would write out an edict or a letter, they would put, you know, as most people would, they would roll the scroll up or the paper up, and then they would put just a, you know, they would melt some wax and put a glob of wax there to seal the paper together. And then so that everybody knew that it did not get broken from the time that the king sent it to the time whoever was supposed to receive it got it, the king would then take his signet ring and he would press it into that melted wax, leaving this imprint that was very unique to him. And so that way they always knew, hey, this is from the king. We can tell this because his seal is upon it. Well, the same way works with us and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's seal upon us that we are His. And the reason why we are His is because we have been bought with a price, and the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, as 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 and 19 states, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so Paul's stating here, he said, Why should you live a pure life? Because your life is no longer your own. He says, your life has been bought, and the Holy Spirit is the seal that you are indeed the king's child. And he said, therefore, you are not to live your life like you used to. You are to live your life now for him. So since our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Ghost, they are not our own. And Paul's admonition is that we use them for the glory of Almighty God. And so this means that we should not only flee fornication, but any sinful habit and any habit out here that would be detrimental to our Christian walk and that would not glorify his name. And so every believer ought to ask themselves this question, is what I am living for worth Christ dying for? I mean, if we're over here, and we're still living our life for the very things that he died for, is that really giving him any glory at all? I mean, he died for fornication. He died for pride. He died for, you know, covetousness and, and, and you know, maliciousness and hatred and things. like that. This is what he died for. So why would we continue to involve ourselves in them when we have been bought with a price? He paid a great price so that we might be freed of these things. So that now we would have the ability to serve Christ in a manner that would glorify his name and help others come to him. And yet many a Christian today still lives their life like they used to. Maybe your used to wasn't fornication like it was for the Corinthians. But it was just this, this idea of just this fleshly content over here where you just immersed yourself over here in Hollywood and, and all these different things and you just kind of live a, a life of luxury and you just have continued to live that and, and you don't want to really get into the work of God and things of that nature because you're enjoying this and hey, I'm saved. I know I'm not under the condemnation of Christ, I, 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 under the condemnation of God because I have put my faith and trust in Christ and that is true. But man, wouldn't it be nice for you to be glorifying him? Wouldn't it be proper for you to say, hey, I'm going to live for you, Lord, out of a heart of thankfulness and a heart that says, I want you to be glorified instead of remaining in those things that Christ saved you from? You know, some, you know, had a bitter spirit back, you know, before they got saved and they got gloriously saved. They still got a bitter spirit now. They still are malicious and hateful and all of these things. And Paul's looking at them and goes, why are you doing that? You have been bought with a price. The Holy Spirit of God has sealed you. He goes, you are God's now. Act like it. Glorify him through your life. And so every one of us ought to ask that question. Is what I am living for worth Christ dying for? 
And if it's not, then by his grace, we ought to seek to change. And that's exactly what Paul was trying to get these people to do. He is saying, you have no business mucking it up over here in the things of the world, just trying to gratify your flesh when God has saved you so that you might have the freedom to live your life on a completely different plane. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful, Lord, for your goodness and your grace in our life. And I am so thankful, Lord, that as a believer, that your condemnation is no longer upon me or upon anyone else in this room that has trusted you as their Savior. But help us to see, Lord, that that freedom came at a cost. And with the freedom that you have given us should come responsibility. Lord, we should not just take this freedom that we have and just use it to satisfy our flesh. But Lord, we have the great opportunity to take this freedom and glorify you with it. To show the change that you can make in a life. And so I would ask, Lord, that you would help us Lord, to live our lives in a manner that would exalt you and not cause your name to be mocked or to be reproached. And so I would ask that you would help each one of us, Lord, to live our lives in a manner that is worth or worthy of the sacrifice that you made for us. We only have so many years here upon this earth. Help us to use them wisely. Lord, we sometimes get so caught up in the things of this world and we love them so that we forget that there is a world around us dying and going to a devil's hell unless they come to know you. But why would they ever want to come to you if they see in us the same attitudes and actions and life that we had before we got saved? How can we possibly go to them and say, look at the change that you can make in their life? if they don't see it in our own. And so I would ask, Lord, that you would help us to be honest with you this morning and that, Lord, if we see ourselves falling short in this manner, that, Lord, you might give us the grace to change so that truly we can live our life in a manner that would be pleasing and honoring to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. 326, if you want to take your hymnal, if not, it's softly and tenderly.
been great to be in the Lord's house this morning. I tell you, what, I've been so encouraged just that all God's already done since we've only been open here for just a few weeks and how many people have, uh, you know, been saved but joined baptism and, uh, and uh, then joined by Satan as well. And we have another one joining us by baptism this morning. So if you'd be seated, we'll have a baptism. Never gets old right there. That is good stuff. <laughs> I tell you what, if you get to see Kylie, tell her congratulations and make certain you let her know that you'll be praying for her as she continues now to serve the Lord. And let's go ahead and stand and we'll be dismissed. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon. You, know, you did well staying there and you know, got your spiritual food and now the meat's for the belly and the belly's for the meat, right? <laughs> and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. God bless you as you go.